my very first Libre Graphics meeting. So if um, I look a bit lost and confused, uh, it's probably because I am. Um, um, and also, I feel a bit of an outsider. And this is because um, I am not an artist. Uh, I'm not a graphic designer. I am not a software engineer that has an interest in graphics. Um, I am, well, I guess I come from the tradition of uh, user-centered, people-centered, human-centered design. Um, Human-computer interaction is kind of my field, and I am halfway through between interaction design and the social sciences. So I'm a bit of a weirdo. Um, so I guess the first thing I need to do is to clarify what I mean by design and what I, what I mean by research in this talk that is titled No Design without research. Um, and what I mean by design is mostly, for the purpose of this talk, is mostly interaction design. And interaction design deals with the behavior of any interactive thing in the world of software. It deals mostly with the structure and behavior of software interfaces, which means that when you make decisions about which features your software should have or how do those features should behave, you are doing interaction design. And understood in this way, interaction design applies to all software and to all kinds of interfaces, and not just the graphical ones. And uh, what I mean by research um, in this talk is any kind of activity that ends up involving users in the process of making software. So basically, it's about getting your users to be part, to take part in the interaction design process. Um, and the question that I keep on having to, I keep on encountering, and I, have, I keep on having all these conversations about, is can interaction design exist without doing research, without involving users in the process of making the software? Um, I'm doing a PhD at the moment, and uh, when I hang out in the university, um, I am surrounded by a lot of people who believe that you should not be doing design without doing research. But then I also spend some time with the free software and the open source software communities, and in those places I run, um, I, I encounter people who are somehow wary, nervous, and sometimes quite hostile to the idea of you doing research uh, with users. And those people I've come to call, I've come to call in a kind of jokey way, the naysayers. And based on their arguments against research, I've come to classify them into four groups. You have the each scratchers, we have the scornful, we have the dismissive, and you have the defeatist. So I want to go through them one by one, if you allow me. So let's start with the each scratchers. Now these are people. <laughs> These are people who believe that uh, they are building software that is uh, exclusively tackling a problem that is their own, solely their own. And their argument goes, well, since this is my problem, and only my problem, the only people I need to do research with is myself. Other people can use the software, but in the understanding that the software is about solving my own problem, and it might not be ideal for their problem. I kind of um, understand this argument, but I think, I think it's somehow detached from reality. Because this is the thing. Your each is only your each as long as you are the only person using the software. The problem, well, the, what, the moment one more person starts using your software, your each becomes only 50% yours. And it's also 50% the each of the other person using the software. When a third, a second user comes along, your each is now 33% yours. When a third user comes along, the each is 25% yours. Did you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> <laughs> By the time you reach 50 users, your each is 2% yours. So sure, you, these people can keep on telling themselves, no, this is my each, but that doesn't change the fact that it really is not anymore. And the thing is that the only way of keeping your each your own is keeping the source code to yourself. But the moment you release the source code, the source code to the world for anybody to use, you need to come to terms with the fact that you have also released your each. So that's the each 
scratchers. The second type is the scornful. And this is the type of people that we call, we call, we quote you, Henry Ford. Um, according to these people, um, human beings really are very bad at articulate, articulating what they need and what they want. And designers are better positioned to do so than themselves. <coughs> these people seem to believe designers have some kind of superpower. That designers are somehow a more evolved type of human being that has overcome this inherently human limitation of articulator, articulating what it is what we, that we want and that we need. Um, obviously, I'm sure I need to convince you that these people who believe designers are in any way superior are kidding themselves. The only superpower designers have is the recognition that we human beings are really bad at articulating our wants and needs. And that there are some things in the design process that can help us overcome those limitations through all sort of work. Things like iterative prototyping and also design research. The third type are the dismissive. And basically these people say that uh, every time you ask other people anything, any opinions related to design, every single person will tell you a different thing. And then the designer is left to fix the mess, to try to, you know, make sense of all these conflicting requirements that are probably unreconcilable and that will lead <coughs> to either design paralysis or God saves us all, design by committee. These people seem to believe that the design research is about asking people what they think about stuff. That design research is about asking people about their opinion. But actually, this is not what design research is at all. Design research is a highly structured activity that is carefully set up in order to answer certain questions. What we call research questions is stuff we want to know more about. Okay, so it's nothing about people's opinions. And what it is about most of the time is observing human behavior. So there is a lot of research that may involve asking people questions, but those questions are normally not directly related to the stuff you're designing. They are about the problems you're trying to solve with your designs, the circumstances and the context in which those problems take place. And also the ways people go about trying to fix the problem themselves, which are very often highly imaginative and quite quirky. But a whole chunk of design research that's not involved asking questions at all. It involves observing. Observing how people go about their business. Observing as well, of course, how they use our software. So design research is not really, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, when we start observing human beings in this way, we realize that we are all slightly different, you know? We go about our business in slightly different ways. But there are also striking commonalities across the, across the differences. You know, these common patterns, these similarities. And it's those similarities that as designers we should be looking for, because they're normally very useful to the work we need to do. So design research is not about, um, it's not about you know, making sense of people's opinions, it's about uncovering the common patterns that underpin our very individual human behavior. And finally, we have the defeatist. And this is the people who think that design research, use of research, it just takes too much out of, out of you. You know, it takes too much time, too much money, too much effort, and because of that, it is not suitable to free software projects. Um, I think, I imagine that when these people, the defeatists hear the word research, these images come into their head of really expensive labs with one-way mirrors and fancy cameras and these very long longitudinal studies or these years-long ethnographic endeavors that end up be becoming like 10,000 word research peer review papers. Um, this is the stuff that academics do. And they do it because they develop theory. But we are not developing theory. We're just trying to make some software. Okay? And uh, in order to make software, um, our research can be a little bit different. So this is the reality of research for, this, for the purpose of software making. Let's talk about time first. How, much, how long does it take to do this type of research? Well, apparently, if you want to do anything that involves talking to people, inspired by interview approaches, six interviews is enough. If you're doing anything that involves 
getting your users to interact with any artifact, five sessions is enough. These sessions should never be longer than 45 minutes, which means that you can run an interview study in four and a half hours and a usability type of study in three hours and 45 minutes. I don't know about you, but I don't think this is that long a time. What about the money? There are certain costs that are often involved in doing this type of research. For example, you might have to travel to meet your participants, or your participants might have to come to you and you need to cover the costs of traveling. But luckily, a ton of research nowadays can be done remotely with things like Jitsi for zero euro. Another cost that is involved in doing research very often is the, that you need to capture it somehow. So you might need audio recording equipment or video recording equipment and stuff like that. Well, nowadays, capturing research can be done for zero euro with the stuff like OBS. And finally, the last stance that you often um, have with research is compensating your participants. When we do research with, pe with people, it's a common practice to give them a little bit of money as a thank you, but money is not the only way of compensating people taking part on research. Free and open source software projects have communities of users that are very committed and very engaged, and very often they will be willing to help you without any money involved. We have to start looking at research, at, at taking part in research as a form of contributing to free and open source software. And there's also other ways of uh, compensating your participants. Um, as part of WebPhD, I recruit a lot of people to take part in my research through an organization called the University of the Third Age. And in exchange for that help, they don't want any money. What they want is training on the stuff they're interested in. So far, we've given them training on Facebook's privacy settings, on GDPR, and also on web third-party tracking. So talk to your users, talk to your research participants, and find out how they want to be compensated for their help. And um, so yeah, it turns out that research can be done actually for zero euro. And I actually do this all the time. And finally, how much effort does it take? A big chunk of the effort that is required in this type of research is making sense of the results, making sense of what the research is trying to tell you. And this process can be done very effectively in teams, in activities like this, what we call an affinity diagram. And uh, you know, that makes it a, a way more fun and also much faster. <coughs> But because our studies tend to be quite small, it's also very likely that you can make sense of the results by yourself in a couple of hours. And that's how it took me, how long it took me to make sense of this particular study that we did recently um, with a piece of video software, video processing software. Um, and then the other bit that takes a lot of time sometimes in research is uh, communicating the results. But to do this, you don't need to write these very long research reports that nobody reads in the end. The research output can be communicated very easily and very quickly in video calls, creating videos or podcasts, or just writing emails to the mailing list or wiki page, like we did in this case. Okay, so it doesn't need to take that much effort either. And finally, just a couple of common sense um, um, recommendations when you do when you want to do research for your free software project. Keep these studies small. If it looks like your research question cannot be answered with a study that looks like the ones I've just described, break it down. Break it down into simpler, smaller questions and run many smaller studies instead of a single huge one. In any case, you're going to learn way more from those several mini studies than from the massive one. So just keep it small. Do research periodically and start to small. Maybe, maybe you do one user interview a month. That's it, that's your target. And for a long time, that was my goal. And that was fine. Because you see, as free and open source software projects, we are not in a hurry. You can build your knowledge about the user base as you go along, as you run more and more of these interviews. Um, so you can take your time with the research. That is fine. And finally, um, what I think we all should remember is that research is not really about activities. Research is an attitude. It's an attitude to, that you bring in every single
single encounter with your user or your prospective user base. An attitude that is about um, a genuine interest, active listening, and a, keen, uh, and a keen observations that come out of that attitude. And um, you can do, you can bring this attitude with you and everywhere you go. So for me, this type of approach that is inspired by ethnography meant, for example, that when I was designing tools for software engineers, I started to use IOC, I learned Git, I learned how to submit patches to the project I was contributing to, I used text editors, played with electronics, learned how to solder, and most importantly, every single day, I sat down with the engineers in my office to have lunch with them. So this type of research doesn't cost any money, and it can be genuinely a lot of fun. Um, so don't let the age scratchers, the dismissers, the scornful, and the defeatist to stop you from doing research for your project. Put on your observing hat and get out there to watch the quirks of your user base. Because you see, I think we can design just software without doing research. But if we want to do good software, the type of software that makes sense to the people who use it, we just cannot do it without messing around with the research bits. Thank you very much, everybody.